Hi everyone, so I'm back again. That's it. Now, in this particular section, I'm going to be having a conversation with you about the metaverse, but since Shamin has already had conversations with you about cryptocurrencies and NFTs, I'll pause for a little moment, let you take a screen grab, take that screen grab, sell it on OpenSea as an NFT, and maybe you'll earn some money. Not much, because I'm pretty much worthless, but nevertheless, you could earn some money, maybe. Um, so, in this introduction to the metaverse, we're going to be talking about a whole variety of different things from now to the future. Now, it's worth noting that when we have conversations about the metaverse, the metaverse is evolving. It's relatively new. However, the metaverse is ultimately, the end game is ultimately the convergence of three worlds. The digital world, the physical world, and the virtual world. And what I mean by that, we'll come to in a little moment. Now, just like blockchain that I had a conversation with you all about earlier, the metaverse is a slow burn mega trend. And uh, earlier, His Excellency mentioned Elon Musk. Elon Musk already wonders whether or not we are living in a simulation. And little do we know, he must have been talking about the metaverse when he tweeted that one. So when we start having a look at the metaverse, it's important to realize that the metaverse is not a technology per se. It's not one technology. The metaverse is the convergence and the combination of multiple different technologies that provide us with a completely new user experience and world. Now, these things include artificial intelligence. We bake artificial intelligence into our metaverse virtual world construct. It's computing. So increasingly, we rely on incredibly powerful computers to produce all of the virtual worlds that ultimately Mark Zuckerberg wants us to be neurologically attached to. I'll come to that in a moment as well. Haptics. So, for example, if I wanted to high-five you all, at the moment, using this construct that we're talking through today, I can do this, but that's not a high-five. If you were wearing a haptic glove and I was wearing a haptic glove, we could high-five for real. That'd be fun. Maybe in the real world. Metamaterials. Metamaterials are important. I'll discuss why later. Networks. When we have a look at the, ev the evolution of 5G and 6G networks, 5G really gives the immersive world steroids. So 5G's ultimate use case is helping us create increasingly immersive augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality environments and experiences. Rendering engines. When we go into the metaverse today, for example, in virtual reality, we have these low resolution avatars. They look a little bit comic-y and game-like. However, as rendering engines improve, which are based in the cloud, and as we can render from the cloud, we will increasingly have photorealistic renders and photorealistic worlds and photorealistic experiences that we can all partake in. Sensing systems. You know, when we have a look at virtual reality constructs today, they play really to two of our senses, vision and hearing. They don't really play to any of our other senses. And of course, the la one of the other technologies that we care about when we talk about the metaverse that I've already mentioned multiple times is virtual reality itself, which again is a combination of all those different technologies and things. Now, today we kind of have this concept of Metaverse Generation 1.0. This is where you use an Oculus Quest or an HTC Vive, you put on your massive virtual reality headset, you have some game controllers, and you can go and have a virtual meeting. Or you can go and play a lightsaber battle, or whatever it happens to be. That's basic Metaverse. Now, as we start fast-forwarding, the metaverse basically is realistically the creation of an infinite, infinite number of different realities. That's an important word. I'll come to that again in a moment. Experiences and worlds. Now, when we start having a conversation about the future direction of the metaverse, some of the questions I get asked is, who will win? Who will be the company that dominates the metaverse? Just like today, we will inevitably see lots of different metaverse platforms. We will have Epic and Fortnite's metaverse platform. 
we will have Facebook's or Meta's Metaverse platform and so on and so forth. Microsoft's Metaverse platform. And we might go into the Facebook platform or the Meta platform, the Minecraft platform, the Roblox platform, the Sony Metaverse platform, and it's going to give us this issue. If I go into Sony's Metaverse world and set of experiences, if I buy products using NFTs, if I buy a new avatar, if I buy a new skin, if I buy a Gucci handbag, if I want that, that's it, because increasingly LVMH is actually going into the metaverse along with companies like Nike. So if I buy a product in my Sony metaverse, I can't really translate that and take that with me to the Minecraft or Microsoft metaverse. I also might not be able to take my digital avatar, my character, my persona that I have in the Sony metaverse to the Microsoft or Meta metaverse. Going to get tongue-tied here. Um, so this is where increasingly there are a variety of different companies looking at what we call the interoperability problem that allows me to move from one metaverse experience to another and take all my stuff, my digital stuff with me and cross between experiences. Now, when we think about the metaverse, one of the biggest problems that we actually have is really a cultural issue. The reason why a lot of people aren't using virtual reality today is because you need a big headset, we don't have much content, the content is relatively low rendered, you know, my friends aren't using it, and so on and so forth. But I mentioned metamaterials. Metamaterials are important for the simple fact that metamaterials are already letting us create virtual reality glasses, not headsets sunglasses. So you put on a set of sunglasses, Ray-Bans perhaps if we're talking about Meta, and you are instantly transported into a virtual reality construct. We also see companies like Bosch who are doing retinal displays that beam images directly into your eyes. So when we have a look at the cultural barriers to you and I going into the metaverse, where I have to use game controllers and everything else, that's coming down. So on the one hand, if I want to enter the metaverse in the future, I put on some sunglasses. As easy as that. I'm not connected to any computers or other devices, just a network. We have smart clothing. Now increasingly smart clothing, I could just put on a regular shirt and it's embedded with sensors, electronics, compute and communications equipment. Bearing in mind that we already have the ability to create fabric-based wearable clothes, that let us do all sorts of different things, including feel different tactile emotions. Um, we can even have, we can even get rid of the virtual reality controllers. I can put on an EMG ring and it senses my muscle behaviors and it knows that I'm typing, it knows I'm doing this, it knows how I'm interacting with whatever it is that I'm doing. And then when we start having a look at all these different technologies and gadgets as they start coming together, as they start miniaturizing, as the cost starts coming down, ultimately it becomes easier for me to take part in a metaverse experience. And then when we start having a look at the end game, this is really sort of where Elon Musk was going and Neo with the Matrix. We can actually believe that we are fully embedded in a simulation. And Indis it's going to be indistinguishable from reality. Because when we really have a look at reality, what is real anyway? I'm talking at you through a screen. I don't necessarily need to be a real person. All I need to be able to do is control the different dots on your screens and the sound coming out of your speakers. I might not be real. It's a construct. So perception is reality. And when we have a look at what we're starting to do in the virtual world, I can already increasingly fool your sense of sight. I can play into your sense of sound. In Japan, they've created virtual reality smell gadgets, which sounds silly when I say it like that. Uh, we've already created virtual reality gadgets that let us taste different foods. In Japan, again, there's actually a screen you can lick. I'm not too sure I'd do that, but nevertheless, it can replicate every single taste of every single food and thing on the planet. And when we have a look at the sense of touch, that's where we bring haptics in. Now, ultimately, as we start fast forwarding, when we start getting towards 2040, and Mark Zuckerberg hired 
the Director General from DARPA a good number of years ago to actually achieve this, why don't we just stream the metaverse experience straight to your brain? Now, to give you an example of what we're doing in this particular space, the neurotech space, we have already managed to demonstrate that using both invasive and non-invasive technologies, we can stream images directly to people's brains and bypass their eyes. So this is actually emerging in the healthcare space, as you'd sort of suspect. So when we start talking about being able to plug you, mind and body, into the Metaverse 2 construct, to the point where it is very difficult for you to distinguish what is real and what is not real, we have a whole variety of exponential technologies coming our way, and a lot of these you can go and play with today. Now, from the laws of the land, in the real world, we're constrained by lots of different laws, like the laws of nature. I'm not floating around my virtual studio because of gravity, but in the metaverse, the metaverse isn't actually subject to any natural laws, which means that we can create any kind of world that we want in any way. Now, from a human law perspective, we are still trying to figure out basically what the regulations and laws for the metaverse, particularly as it relates to things like adverts, privacy, all these kinds of different things, should actually look like. Even when we start talking about things like neurojacking, which is a completely different subject. Um, so the metaverse, when we get to metaverse 2.0, we literally break your reality. And that's really 2035 we'll have those technologies coming through. In addition to that, when we go into the metaverse today, if we, if we were having a meeting, if we were having this meeting basically in the metaverse, I would know that you're a real person. We could have a genuine conversation. But this is DigiDug. DigiDug is a digital human. Increasingly, as we start moving through the next decade, some of the things and objects and organisms and th entities that we are going to collaborate with, talk with, engage with, are actually going to be digital. So digital humans. We already have different entities with neural network brains that allow you to interact in virtual reality. And they have their own behaviors and they evolve their own behaviors and they evolve their own body shapes. So we literally come back to this breaking reality. Now, from a sample use case perspective, the metaverse is more than just next generation media. You can ultimately, we'll say digitize, that's rather crude, basically when we start having conversations basically about the metaverse, but we can increasingly digitize any kind of experience. I can digitize entertainment. I can digitize the Abu Dhabi Louvre, and I can walk around the Abu Dhabi Louvre in a virtual reality construct. I can touch the paintings. I can interact with the paintings. I can go into the paintings, for example, as well, let alone anything else. When we have a look at gaming, I can game in the metaverse. When we have a look at events, I'll come to those in a moment. That's a very interesting subject that Sony, for example, is now zeroing in on. When we have a look at the sector by sector use cases for the metaverse, every single sector has a play in the metaverse, whether it is banking, whether it's education. So for example, I've been creating a virtual reality university and this allows us to go and experience, for example, aircraft manufacturing centers at scale, where we have thousands of students coming in to walk around different experiences, in that case, factories and so on and so forth. Entertainment. Uh, when we have a look at government, basically we have some interesting use cases in government. When we have a look at health, you know, if I just put on some sun, something that looks like sunglasses, I can have a virtual reality doctor's appointment Increasingly different systems, wearables, and different technologies. And when we have a look at things like the quantified self, that doctor has full access to all my biomarker information, my biometric information, my neural information, my behavioral information, and much, much more. And then gig economy, I mentioned entertainment. We've already seen the metaverse being used by organizations like Epic. So there have been Travis Scott gigs taking place, as well as Justin Bieber gigs taking place, where increasingly tens of millions of people come to these different gigs to participate, to share the experience, to buy stuff, to collaborate in marketplaces and all that sort of thing. Public services. In Saudi Arabia, we have Neon. But when Neon was actually being designed and being thought through, they didn't see the metaverse coming. So now we actually have Seoul 
who want to now be the first city in the metaverse. So the idea here is that as a private citizen, if I can't actually get to the city hall in Seoul, I can use a metaverse-like experience to visit the city hall and engage and interact with all the people in city hall in a virtual environment. So this is where we actually end up with smart cities with digital twins that are put into the metaverse that then allow citizens to interact with different public services in different ways, in an accessible way that they wouldn't have been able to do previously. Uh, we have virtual, re virtual realty, not just virtual reality. And some actually believe that virtual realty market could be worth a trillion dollars. Now, an example of this is someone recently bought a piece of virtual land for $4.3 million. So if you think that the metaverse is infinite scale, we already see people buying up virtual land that doesn't actually exist as NFTs, and that's just crazy. Um, but it's a thing. Um, and then finally, when we have a look at virtual nations, if you consider this, the US government, for example, is increasingly worried about virtual nations because if you have a look at a lot of the governments today, who's more powerful, President Z or Joe Biden? Mark Zuckerberg resides over a virtual community that has 2.5 billion people. Z looks after a community that has, well, 1.2 billion people. So this concept of virtual nations is incredibly interesting. Now, what we mean by that is from an Abu Dhabi perspective, do you put Abu Dhabi into the metaverse? Can people then come and tour Abu Dhabi as they would normally and naturally using all these different exponential technologies that I've mentioned about? However, do we then promote e-citizenship e uh, concepts? Do we have e-residence? So could I become an e-resident? of a metaverse-based Abu Dhabi. If I am, do I pay tax, local tax, basically to the government in Abu Dhabi so that you can improve real world physical services? Um, so this then starts knocking into conversations about the future of government, the future of residency and visas and all sorts of different things. And increasingly, because the metaverse is borderless, does this then mean that Abu Dhabi, a metaverse-based Abu Dhabi could literally be borderless. And so the metaverse, basically, while it is actually still relatively nascent, shows a huge amount of promise. But at a, in order to summarize, the metaverse's end game ends up breaking our reality and transforming how global businesses, culture, and societies work, interact, and operate. And the final one, virtual workplaces, we could actually be working in the, in the metaverse. And in fact, actually, I've recently written a codex in the, meta, in the metaverse, not just on the metaverse, uh, which was a really weird experience. So increasingly, when we have a look at platforms like Meta Horizons, Meta Infinite Office, increasingly, we can have our entire workforce and workspaces in virtual reality, and they can be using 5G to control ro robot surgeons, or they can be using it to construct 3D printed buildings, basically in Abu Dhabi or in South Korea, as we've seen already. There's a huge amount of possibilities, basically, when we start talking about the combination of all these different technologies against the backdrop of the metaverse. And that's it. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much again. And it's been my honor. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. That's, that's really, really interesting and great. At the uh, early childhood authority, uh, I could not help it but thinking about what type of, uh, you know, uh, realities and, 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 uh, 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 and uh, societies our children will be living in in the next 20 years. Interesting ones. That's the way I will put that. <laughs> yeah.